I wanted to just share a little bit about how I got into this work and where my passion is drawn from every single day. This photo is a photo of my family and uh, I, I live with now just my husband and my youngest son is with us occasionally. He's a college student so he's around every once in a while. And then I'll describe for you uh, the photo. So on the far left of the group photo is my husband Brad. He's a stay-at-home dad and has been for um, our entire married life since we had children. And he is a primary support person for his brother Nathan, who's on the opposite side of that photo. Nathan lives with autism and other complex uh, neurodevelopmental disabilities and we chose to direct our own support services, so we do self-direction in the state of Minnesota. It's called Consumer Directed Community Supports. We've been doing that now for almost 15 years, and Nathan lives in an apartment that is self-contained and attached to our house, so it's in, in proximity to where we live. I always joke that I very rarely am invited to his house and never just barge in, but he's in our house every day for one reason or, or another. And it works for us, but to be honest, one of the things I'll talk to you about today is retirement, and we're concerned about our own retirement and what's gonna happen with Nathan uh, when we choose to retire. My two sons are in that photo too. My son Amos is in the black shirt. He actually lives in southwestern Colorado and is totally self-sufficient, pays all his own bills, and I'm a proud mama because of that. And my youngest son is in the blue and gold shirt in the middle of our family photo, and he was diagnosed with ADHD his, the very first day of his freshman year of high school. And I'll reflect on that as we're going through the, the life course, I'm sure, in my presentation. And then his sophomore year, he sustained a rather serious brain injury in a football accident. It was one of those situations where the player's down on the field and you're wondering who it is and then you realize, oh, it's my kid. And when we got to the field, he could not feel anything um, from his waist down. So he's made a lot of progress but has some, some permanent uh, disabilities as a result of that, that injury and our two dogs, just because they're a part of our family. In the middle, you probably see mostly a, a set of balloons that's bigger than the woman holding them. And that is my mother-in-law, my husband's mother. She moved to Minnesota in October because she has rather significant uh, dementia. And so we're one of those families now that is supporting our kids, somebody our own age, and um, one of our elders to live as independently and be included in their communities as much as possible. So I come from that framework every single day. We hire staff uh, alongside of Nathan to help provide his supports, but every day we live the reality of working within a system of support and care for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. In my work, as you, you could take our mission and it would be very similar to the Mind Institute's mission. We are a university center on excellence in developmental disabilities and primarily I see my job to conduct research that's going to change policy and practice. And so that's what I do every day in my work life. What I hope that you'll take away from my comments this morning are to identify at least one research-based uh, strategy that will promote communi community inclusion at each stage in life and then to also be very clear about the positive outcomes that inclusion has for children, youth, adults, and elderly with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I thought it important to start out with just some, what I see as grounding truths. These are things we know and these should be the foundation of all of our work, whether we are a service practitioner, a family member who's advocating, a person with a disability who's advocating, uh, or a researcher. So the first grounding truth for me is that all people and their families have the right to live, work, play, and pursue their life 
uh, aspirations in their communities of choice. A second grounding truth for me is that everyone needs supports, all of us do, and most people really want to be as self-determined, make choices on their own, and be as independent as possible. Doesn't mean that we're not all inter interdependent, but we should be moving towards as much independence as we want and be able to sustain that over our lifetime. Grounding truth number three, an individual's subjective lens of their experience is really central to their true social inclusion. So their ability to feel like they belong, if they feel like they're rejected or ignored, then they are generally, genuinely not included. So it's really important to keep that in mind that every person's perspective on how well they're included is what should drive whether we see them as included and they uh, are included. Grounding truth number four, our communities are better when everyone is included. And grounding truth number five, uh, research is worth less if it does not influence practice and policy. And a lot of research that's done in this field is just research to do research. And so um, I think that's an important truth to hold true to. And then this is just another grounding truth that we don't talk about very much. We talk a whole lot about the system of services and supports in the community, and we try to fix and change the system of supports in the community. But the truth is that most people living with intellectual and developmental disabilities are not in the system. They're not receiving services from the system. And this sort of, this data sort of shares that with you, as does the picture. So the light green shows the percentage of people who are, have an intellectual or developmental disability and are known to state developmental disability systems and receive some sort of services. And the navy blue in the picture gives you an illustration of the people who have intellectual and developmental disabilities but are not receiving services. So we know there are just under seven and a half million people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the United States. About 5.25 million of those are children. We know a whole lot more about children with intellectual and developmental disabilities than we do adults. And of those, 1.4 million get services authorized and funded by uh, state developmental disability services. So that's 46% of adults and 12% um, of children. The reason the children is so low is because they're supported in education for the first 20 plus years of their life. So with those kind of grounding truths, I'm gonna move on. And let's start with early intervention, early, the early childhood years. One of the things that we've built in this country, and I think it's a good thing, is that it's really family engaged work for children at this age in their life. Families are really the place where intervention happens, the place where social inclusion is most likely to happen. They're really the center of our child, early childhood programming. And the experiences that families have in early childhood really sets the tone for what's gonna come later and what their expectations are and how they experience supporters, people who are there to help their child and their family. So I think that's really important and I'll never forget when my youngest son, Jack, was in preschool, he was in a Montessori preschool program by our university, and we went in for a comp his first like conference. And the teacher sort of, right when I sat down, slid a business card over in front of me. And it said, 612348-TOTS. Well, right away I knew what that was. That's our early intervention hotline, the number you call if you have concerns about your child's development. And so I was really like, oh, there's a problem here. And 
nobody's talked to us about it. And then she jumps right into everything that's wrong with my son. And it did set a huge, it made a huge difference in how I thought about it. I, I went along, called 348 TOTS, had him assessed, but my attitude was formed immediately by the fact she didn't talk about any of his strengths. She had not anywhere up to the time of that very first case conference said anything to us about any concerns about our son. And I resisted supports for him for a very long time. And it wasn't really until middle school that both my husband and I were like, hmm, he's really struggling. When you had to start going from teacher to teacher to teacher and get papers from classroom to classroom to classroom, things started to kind of fall short. Had that teacher approached us differently in those early years and focused on his strengths and brought up some of his challenges in a different way with us, I'm curious what the course of his um, early education and K-12, early years in K-12 would have been. So the United States Department of Health and Human Services and Department of Education have some pretty strong policy statements around the importance of inclusive early education. And what this refers to is essentially including kids with disabilities in early childhood um, programs with kids who do not have disabilities setting high expectations and intentionally promoting full participation in learning activities, in social activities, and by supporting the accommodations that young children need, using evidence-based supports to promote development, peer relationships, and belonging. So from the very beginning, the importance of peer relationships and belonging are known. We know we need to do this to have the best outcomes, not only in early, early life, but also as people age and get older. And this applies that those findings apply to all kids, whether they have a disability or not. So when we think about early childhood and inclusive programs, and think about, okay, well, what are the outcomes? And what are some dimensions of quality of those programs? Here are some things that we know. Uh, we know that uh, desired outcomes include a sense of belonging, positive peer relations, and learning to full potential. So those seem pretty intuitive and are well grounded in policy. We know that early childhood programs are elevated when they include children with disabilities. So people without disabilities um, fare very well when kids with disabilities are in those classrooms. Social communication and academic skills include an increase for both children with and without disabilities. And it requires successful and really intentional planning and um, purposeful interventions to be successful at providing inclusive uh, early intervention. And in a lot of ways, we have a long, maybe longer to go in early intervention and inclusion than we do elsewhere because so much of early childhood education is private and is not uh, regulated in ways that would ensure inclusion. So we have a long, long way to go. We know that early inclusion values policies and practices that support kids to fully participate, equally be valued, and um, that families and members of our communities have to embrace that. Let's move on to school years. And we know the most about inclusion in schools, if that make, it makes total sense to me, because kids are sort of captive, right? They go to K-12 schools, whether they're public or private, there's reporting that has to happen. And so we can monitor how well we're doing better in education than we can in some other services and supports. And what is astonishing to me is, I'm gonna share some data with you, starting in K-12, ending in adult life, and the same numbers are kind of there. 
So the number of kids included in K-12, the number of adults in competitive employment, and on and on and on, those percentages hover right around the same. So here's some things that we know. We know that inclusive education really is about being included and belonging, and we have some really good frameworks for what that means. What do we mean by belonging? Eric Carter's probably the researcher that's done the most in this country to define it. This framework is used in K-12, and I'm gonna share some slides with you later around how this framework is included in other areas of life. But what, what his model shows us is that it involves being present, being invited, being welcomed, being known, not just to one or two people, but known to everybody, being accepted, being involved and engaged, like being invited to do things and being involved in, in more than just being there, being supported, being heard, being befriended, and I think one of the most important things is being needed. And this kind of goes back to Wolfensberger's framework around va valued social roles. Like if we have roles where we're needed, we're more included. That makes sense to me. But this is a framework that we promote in our K-12 work at the Institute on Community Inclusion around inclusive education. Here's what the research tells us about kids who are included in K-12 schools. There's convincing evidence that there's really positive outcomes on inclusive education. And the research shows us that there are gains in literacy, math, science, social studies, the goals that are written into a person's individual education plan, communication, and academic engagement. So we know that. Yet, the graph on the right of this slide tells us kind of a concerning story. It shows the percentage of students with really extensive support needs that are in inclusive settings. So only 3% are in general education, 4% are in so resource room placements, 13% are in a totally segregated um, separate part, separate school, and then 80%, just under 80%, are in a self-contained pl placement. So they might be in the school, but they're segregated within the school and are not included with kids without disabilities. So we have a long, long, long way to go uh, in, in education and promoting inclusion. So what the data tells us is that instructional context really, really matters. In inclusive settings, 100% in, in a study that was done by G, 100% uh, of the students improved their communication and literacy skills, 93% improved their numeracy skills. And in that study, kids who were in segregated classrooms, 73% made no progress at all in communication and literacy, 67% made no progress in numeracy skills, and 7% actually regressed in communication and numeracy skills. So the evidence in research is pretty clear, and it really is about how do we teach educators, and not just special educators, how do we teach general educators to include children with complex disabilities and support needs in the classroom. And it's really about how we accommodate and how we change our instructional design to meet everybody's needs. This is just a little short clip I'm gonna share with you on a science lesson around Newton's law that's being taught to a child with complex learning needs. A close-up of Newton's cradle. When one sphere at the end is lifted and released, it strikes the stationary spheres, transmitting a force through the stationary spheres that pushes the last sphere upward. The last sphere swings back and strikes the nearly stationary spheres, repeating the effect in the opposite direction. Newton's Law. 
Inclusive sixth grade science with Jamie Keeley, general education science teacher. For me, the most essential thing was thinking about the motion essential element. And that is for him to understand um, mass and height and how that affects motion. A middle school science classroom, a student is working with a Newton's cradle. So if I can isolate Newton's third law and use uh, a hands-on manipulative such as a Newton's cradle, we can generate um, models where he can see if I drop one sphere at a certain height, the uh, only one sphere will move on the other side as an opposite reaction. But if I drop two spheres, then we can see two. So as a direct result from his motion, uh, he can see the result. So I can isolate um, at least one of those points, which is how height is involved with motion. Ms. Keeley sitting next to AJ and his lab partner at a table. AJ is using a Newton's cradle as Ms. Keeley provides an explanation. You don't want to throw it. You want to just let your fingers go. There you go. Look how cool that is. See, so look. AJ, a sixth grade student. What's happening, science experiment girl? So you're doing an experiment with a girl? Yes. And she's helping you? Yeah, class. Nice. Ms. Keeley, standing at the front of the science classroom, speaking to her group of students. Are you only able to bring one of the spheres up no. at a time? No. What could you do? You could do four. You could do four. Wouldn't be that exciting because it would just kind of be like this. Ms. Keeley passing out Newton's cradles to the students in the class. She and Melissa DeToda, an EC support staff member, are demonstrating how to use the cradles with the students. It is even the simplest little tangle that can cause a big, big problem. So guys, do not touch these yet. Who is with me? So that gives you just an idea or an illustration of how how uh, in inclusion can happen in a classroom. So one of the things that we do at our center is to try to work with school districts and state departments of education across the United States to improve those numbers in inclusive education and to improve instruction to general ed and special ed teachers around their roles. And we've created this pathway so that we can move beyond those examples of schools, and I know you have hundreds and hundreds of them in your state where they do great inclusive education. But it is not the norm for children with the most significant disabilities and the most significant needs and we need to improve everywhere in the country. And so uh, I've given you this as a resource, a place you can go to work with your local districts, and a, a map, a pathway to get towards more inclusive education. So let's move on to transition, and I think this is one of the most, it's equally as important as early intervention, and it's one of the most difficult. How many of you, either online or here in the audience, have heard of the transition cliff? So children who are done with K-12 education, done with their transition programs, and then they just hit this cliff of what now? What do we do now? I would assume that most of you have, have had that experience. And if we look at the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it's pretty clear that we're expected to support children in transition to help prepare them not only for further education, but also for employment and independent living. And these are things that often get lost in, transi in transition programs. But, but there's federal law that says we need to be doing this. And if you think about what transition means, it really means working with uh, adolescents and a time frame from adolescence to adulthood where we're planning for things like post-secondary education, careers, health care, financial benefits, housing, where's a person going to live, what are they going to do to earn money, those kinds of things. And we're trying to do this by bridging education services, child services with adult services, and that's what makes it so hard because in many states, the, they're not integrated. They're not the same, they're not the same system in, in nearly all states. Quality in transition planning means that we're helping them, helping youth 
to set and then achieve their short and long-term goals. We know that if we do well at planning in transition, it will increase graduation rates. It increases the number of youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities who attend post-secondary education. It in increases the number of, of young adults who enter into competitive integrated employment. We know that it increases their ability to live independently. And another big piece, and this is so often left off, it's almost as if people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, once they're done with K-12, people don't think that they still have learning to do around reading, writing, uh, math, those kinds of things. And those academic skills are things we learn throughout our lifetime, and people with intellectual disabilities need, need that as much as anybody. Here are some things that are really important to produce quality transition. We know that quality will be improved and smooth transition will happen when these things are in place. Schools like this, this building, the people who work in this school need to have connections with local businesses and employers and have a network that they're working with to refer students and to create programming. Community organizations have to be in place and schools need to have connections with them early around housing, health, and other needs. Civic groups are very helpful in transition efforts, uh, having established relationships with community leaders and community organizers are just essential. And schools have to have the infrastructure that ins ensures students, schools, case managers, adult service providers, voc rehab, and families are all working together. And that it's not just a checkbox that we've had the transition planning meeting. That everybody is sincerely working together and that is put in place with memorandums of understanding. I'm sure many of you have heard of Project Search. I was really an early critic of Project Search, actually. And what I was critical about was it didn't, it didn't land people in jobs. But it's really not what it's intended to do. It's really intended to be a transition-related program. Uh, it's an evidence-based internship model where students with intellectual and developmental disabilities towards the end of their high school years are getting work experience. And the goal is that they'll obtain, eventually, uh, integrated employment after they're done with their internship, within four to 11 months. And in Minnesota, this has been pretty systematized by our Department of Education and the success rate, 72% of students who are going through Project Search as a part of their transition programming are, are reaching that goal of competitive integrated employment. Now the challenge is not all students get to be involved in Project Search, um, but of those that do, it's a really effective um, program when you look at those long-term employment outcomes. Another critical piece around transition is to focus on peer support and if you look in the, in the video I showed you of the importance of having that lab partner who was helping uh, to support the student in early intervention, it's a really critical piece, and it's a critical piece at really every stage of life. But peer support interventions can include creating those regular opportunities for students with and without disabilities to learn aside, alongside of one another in a classroom and during other activities during the school day, creating work-based learning opportunities like Project Search does. Uh, Step Up is another really good program that encourages youth with disabilities, provides opportunities for career exploration, and that is uh, a peer-to-peer -peer kind of groups of peers who are, are in that kind of a program, and then evolving natural supports in the work environment is a critical component of peer support. One, this is getting a lot more attention really in the last five to seven years, I would say, and there's an increasing number of inclusive higher education programs in this country, 
though I would venture to guess that most of them are not truly inclusive. And I'll criticize the ones in my own state first. We have about six, and none of them are inclusive in the way that I think of inclusive higher education, which is about giving access to higher education for students with really significant support needs uh, who have intellectual and developmental disabilities and offering the same rights, same experiences, same benefits, getting the same outcomes as you're striving for for all other students uh, who are attending that post-secondary program and that the outcome is a meaningful credential that's awarded by that Institute of Higher Education. And here's why it's important. We know that students are more likely to be employed if they've graduated from a post-secondary education program. They earn more than their peers who do not attend. They have a higher level of independence. They have better physical health and healthier relationships, and they rely less on social security, income, and vocational rehabilitation services. So these are studies that have been done looking at students with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have gone to post-secondary education programs and completed them and then compared them to groups uh, who have not. So when I think of inclusive higher education, it's, there, there are 10 really essential components to make it inclusive and that is to have academic access and inclusive instruction. So a lot of these programs have separate segregated classes off to the side. They're not uh, including students with intellectual and developmental disabilities in the classes that every other student uh, attends. To be inclusive, you have to be in the same classroom. Most of them have a component of person-centered planning where you're really working with that student, their social network, their family in advance to strategize how you're going to have a successful post-secondary uh, effort. They involve career development. They ensure campus engagement. So you're not just going to classes and then going home. You're a part of that campus community and engagement. And one of the things we know about that for all college students is the more engaged they are in campus, the more likely it is that they will, will graduate with a four-year degree. It also offers the opportunity for choice and self-determination, that it's not a one-size-fits-all. Here, if you come to this post-secondary inclusion program, this is what you get. And most college students, they're overwhelmed by the, the opportunities and choices on a campus. They also need to offer paid work and internship experiences because those are the things that get you closer to employment. They need to offer both on and off campus living, just like whatever the requirements are where my son goes to college, he's required at this university to be on campus two years out of the four years. So to be inclusive, those rules should be the same for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Opportunities for engagement in campus clubs and events and activities. In order for these programs to be successful, there have to be peer mentors and support, and those folks have to be trained. And then, as I said previously, a degree or certificate. Some strategies that partners need to use to um, enhance inclusion are to build allyships across campus, uh, with key stakeholders. I know at our university we start with the Equity and Inclusion Office, gain administrative and faculty support. If you don't have those allies, uh, you're not going to get very far. Intentional planning based on best practice and then uh, using existing campus-wide systems and practices to include students with intellectual and developmental disabilities instead of trying to just build something unique and different and special on the side. So those are some things about uh, transition and let's move into adult and community living. One of the things in this country I think we can be very proud of 
is that in the last 30 years, we have really done an excellent job in figuring out how to support people who can no longer live at home in places other than institutions. Now I say that and I worry a whole lot about, well, what are the other kinds of institutions where people are finding themselves? But if you look at this, this graph, at, a, at our peak, we had just under 200,000 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities living in institutions in this country. And today, we're right around 16,000. And that was in a pretty short amount of time. For every five people in an institution 30 years ago, only one remains today. And there really are not children in public institutions for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Now that said, um, I'll get to some of the things that, that are challenges here in a minute. We have 17 states and the District of Columbia who serve nobody in an institution anymore. And we have four states that still serve over a thousand people in institutions. I think that this data is misleading though, and this is data from our, our institute. Uh, what's misleading about it is that we know a lot of kids in schools, particularly children with autism, find themselves in mental health institutions, being moved out of states into institutions, campuses where uh, only children with significant ASD are served. And so there are other places that we, where kids are going, we just don't know how to identify and gather that data very accurately. That said, over the years, we've defined community living uh, in, in different ways, and, and we've evolved to, to have a much more refined definition. In the beginning, you were living in the community if you just didn't live in an institution. That's really all we cared about. And then, you were living, when you were living in the community, you were still segregated though. So we had these big group homes that, and, and many of them were 15 people to 30 people. Um, that was considered community living, uh, but you were in segregated programs. Then we decided, well, that's not quite community living, so let's define it as 15 or fewer, then six or fewer, uh, then three or fewer, and you were of the community. And now we're kind of in this, we'll live where and with whom you want. Choose who you want to live with. Choose where you want to live, what your zip code's going to be. Uh, preferably own your own lease or your own home. And our focus is really on belonging and including. And I challenge my colleagues often to think about institutionalization, and I firmly believe that size doesn't matter. You can live with your family and be living in an institutional type setting. You can live just with yourself and have staff coming into your home, and it can feel very institutional, because in my mind, institutionalization is more about an attitude than the number of people, uh, although the number of people is important. So I share that just because we've, we've evolved over the last 30 years in terms of how we think about uh, community living and where people live. There are some newer models, and I say newer because some of these have been around for 20 years. It's just they're not used very much, and they're not what our service system is incentivizing or, or pushing forward as much, depending on the state you live in. So shared living is one, and that's where you live in a home or an apartment with, with a couple, three people you want to live with, and you share uh, your living environment. In some states, that is, it's a model where it's one person, and they're living with a person without a disability, and that person without a disability is responsible for their support needs 24-7 and gets respite uh, coming in. We have a company, this is kind of interesting because <laughs> part of their company's best practice and part of their company's worst practice. So I'm only sharing with you the best practice part of, of what they do, but it's a shared living model called Roomy, and I put a link in the sl slides for you to, to sort of look at it. What I like about it is 
the way in which they pay for the shared living companion provides a livable wage for that individual, and they have a really robust way in which they match people. So I think that's really important. Increasingly, we're seeing programs where a, a provider either works with an existing apartment building or an existing developer, and it might be an entire development or it might be just one building of a development, but there's intentionality around uh, creating inclusive apartment buildings where there might be one apartment where there's sort of a staff pod and then people live throughout that building with intellectual and developmental disabilities along with people who don't have intellectual and developmental disabilities. That model, I think, is being used more and more. In almost every state, not all, but in most states, self-direction is a model that's available. And the idea there is you're allocated resource, and then you get to decide how you use that resource to, to, support, to meet your support needs. As I said, we use that with Nathan. Very early on, uh, we decided we're going to have half the staff, but we're going to make sure that the staff are highly skilled, highly competent, because retaining staff is what's going to get him uh, the best outcomes. And we've been very successful. In that time, we've lost one staff person, and he retired. So that was just our one, one big thing for us. Another big thing for us was, well, we're going to use the resources we're given to incentivize the outcomes he wants. And Nathan has autism. His interests change um, periodically. And I remember at the very beginning, he had this ginormous reticulated tegu-like lizard thing. And he had a big, big python that he would wrap all around his neck. And, I had an agreement with him that if that, if that snake got through the vent that connects our houses, that I was taking the ice chipper to it, and he could be mad at me for all eternity, but it was not ever to enter my home. But he needed to be around people not like me that was like, I'm going to cut your snake's head off with an ice chipper. He needed to be around people who liked that. And I did not want to be the person to help get him connected to what is called herpetology clubs. And I knew they existed because we have this Renaissance Festival and there's a parade of people who like to have snakes. They'd have snakes around them and then they'd have these big lizards on leashes. And so very early on, that was one of the incentive bonuses. You get Nathan connected to her herpetology club where there's reciprocity in the relationship. He's getting something from them. He's giving something to them. We'll give you a financial bonus. And we've done that for 15 years, and it works. It works <laughs> extremely well. Whereas prior to that, staff wanted to teach him how to do his laundry. And at the time, I didn't want him. We have a shared basement and I didn't want him touching my washer and dryer. I was very clear about that. So we had a trade-off. He mowed the lawn. I did his laundry. That worked for us. But the staff felt he should do his own laundry. But we really wanted him out in the community. And so when we got to, to develop our own services, we could shape them how we wanted them to be. That's, that's our story, but there's a thousand, thousand, thousand others, uh, depending on people's choices in, in life. And then increasingly now, this is an interesting model, and it's really interesting to balance it with federal rule called the Home and Community-Based Services Settings Rule, but I'm, I'm going to set that rule aside. But there's a really interesting model where we're bridging support needs for people who are aging and are elderly and people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in shared living models. And I, I think that's probably OK. It's really interesting to me. And I'll share with you, after Brad's mom moved here, the only way we could keep her in independent living was to have some help in checking on her to make sure she was OK, make sure she took the meds we laid out for the night before, those kinds of things. 
So Nathan goes every single day, because she lives two and a half blocks from us, he goes every single morning and checks on her. And the connection he has made to lots of other people who live there, his sense of feeling like he has purpose and he's needed has, has radically changed his attitude about his daily life. And so I think there's something there that we should continue to explore. And then for those of you who are families, really you gotta start thinking about this stuff when your kids are extremely young. And what, what are you building toward how your child will be supported when you're not there? You can't wait until they're until you're old and ready to um, retire or move on. We're right there with Nathan, and our our idea is that our sons will take over his care needs, but their lives aren't stable yet. So we can't quite make those decisions until they know where they're going to land. And then with generations of our kids, it seems like they move jobs like every two or three years. So the concept of continuity and stability, we can't quite make those decisions yet. We've been very open with our kids for a very long time about how Uncle Nathan is going to need their help. And they have a pact. My oldest son is, I'll take care of all the finances, all the paperwork. Jack, all the emotional stuff is on you. <laughs> and it's just how they're wired. And it, it would work great if they're both around to do that. So there are lots of models. Let's move on to employment. Uh, for all of us, employment is really important for a lot of reasons. It's because that's how we earn money to pay our bills, our benefits. It provides us with daily structure. For me, during COVID, when I, had, I was forced to work at home and didn't have that daily structure, that was super hard for me. It gives us purpose. It's where many of us meet our friends. I personally met my husband at work. And it gives us dignity and self-worth. There are lots of different employment models. There's center-based uh, programs or sheltered workshops. There's group work where groups of people go out in a crew or an enclave and work. And then there are various competitive integrated employment. Supported employment is where you have a job coach and they're helping you enter and sustain and learn your job. Customized employments where we've carved and kind of created a job with an employer that matches your strengths. And then uh, self-employment, these are also sometimes called micro enterprises. So I want to talk a little bit about the benefits of this. There are economic benefits, as we said, um, you earn more money than peers who are working in facility-based centers. You typically get more work hours if you're in competitive integrated employment, and you typically have access to better benefits. The psychological benefits are increased social belonging and inclusion, personal independence, autonomy and self-determination, uh, and then uh, your daily living support needs are, are reduced because you're at work. Some things to think about in terms of customized employment is it's really one person and one job at a time. So it it's, takes a lot of time to find that right match. It has to be strengths-based uh, employment that fits the job seeker. So for example, there are a lot of things I could not do because they're not my strengths. And that's, that's really what we're getting at. And then um, fading to not having to have support on the job. There's a, a young woman uh, in Minnesota who started her own self-employment. She really liked I wish I can't eat them anymore because the older you get, the, your teeth aren't as green as they were when you were young. But those little corn nuts is what they're, that's what the brand was that I used to eat. And you, they're really, really, really crunchy. Well, she created her own. She loved them. She wanted, she had this idea of making different flavors. And I gave you a link to uh, Sunshine Susie's niblets. And she's got a whole business that she runs around taking the corn grown on her family's farm and turning it into a corn niblets. Eric's story is kind of a good example of transition to work. So when he was in transition, 
Uh, he worked at the Ashland Productions Theater where he'd kind of help out before shows and greet people. He did some volunteering at a place called Arks Value Village on the sales floor and he tagged things and cleaned things up. Then he entered his job search and Eric would be the first one to tell you what I learned in my volunteer experiences really prepares me for uh, beginning to search for my job. He works now at Target part-time uh, and he stocks things there, stocks merchandise. Um, and then he also works at a place called Best Security and he's a super, super sports fanatic. So he works during Minnesota Vikings and Minnesota Gophers games um, and other events. And again, he sort of checks tickets and answers questions. If you think about how we're doing in this country around employment, it's just like inclusive education. The numbers are almost exactly the same. Uh, in California, this is the most recent national data, um, about 8, about 16 percent of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are in competitive integrated employment. Nationally, 22 percent. Not that we're competing, but we're slightly ahead of um, California, but we do terrible um, around employment. One thing to worry about is the increase in non-work day supports um, for people. And the gray shows you how much that's going up. And the green shows you that integrated competitive employment is sort of stagnant. So in terms of health care, it's just also the message is you have to build it into transition. It's an area that's really forgotten. There are too few adult providers. Uh, most schools won't touch on it. Um, and what we know from providers is they're not trained and they want more training on how to best support people. Another area that we don't talk much about is retirement. So most people with intellectual and developmental disabilities kind of just keep working <laughs> and nobody thinks to say, hey, you're of retirement age or hey, your body is giving you indicators that you're really slowing down and need more rest. And we need to be thinking about retirement and building it into support plans and thinking about inclusive retirement. We know people with IDD are living much longer, and we know that about a third who are over the age of 65 um, and participate in segregated services don't participate in any formal activity outside of their home, so it gets kind of stagnant. And we know that there are a lot of benefits from retirement. You get to catch up on your sleep, finally. Life isn't as stressful when you're not working. Those kinds of things are, are really critical. And in terms of supporting uh, inclusive retirement, here are some suggestions. Really building it into the retirement education and planning in, into disability services, providing peer role models that can illustrate successful messages about retirement, um, looking at retirement not just at indicators of how old you are, but again that whole body system and how you're doing. Gradually transitioning can help people and um, begin activities before retirement so there's a smoother transition. Faith communities are also a really important place for inclusion and a lot of times we just don't address it or people don't have access to their faith communities. So participation in faith tradition provides people with purpose, meaning, uh, community connections. And this is an area where Eric Carter's framework for inclusion was really built and it's the same exact framework that we use uh, in our work in education. One last area I want to talk about is end of life and it's just so important to bring people with intellectual and developmental disabilities into their own um, opportunities to talk about their own end of life as well as the end of life of people that they love and care about. In this country, funerals are really a socially important event, event for people. Um, funerals are meaningful to people. It brings us closure. Um, it helps us understand the death. And too often, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are excluded 
um, and they don't even get informed about death and dying. I had a colleague who worked at our center for years and years and years. She died unexpectedly at a younger age. She had a son with very significant support needs who lived in a group home. Her husband and daughter chose not to tell court that their mother's dead. How is he ever gonna understand if you don't share and don't prepare people for um, planning that? So to support that uh, end of life, uh, we have to talk about it. We have to use opportunities um, such as Catch things you see on TV, using it as an opening to talk about birth and death and the life cycle. So there are common barriers. I just want to go through a couple of those. Uh, ableism is live and well. Uh, we all know that. One of the biggest is staffing issues, and those are not going to go away. They're going to get worse and worse just based on demographics. So it's direct support professionals, but also uh, specialists. Disparities are alive and well. There are finite resources to support our services, and the variability across states is really, really, really significant. So just a few concluding thoughts. Changing minds and attitudes around all of inclusion across a lifetime takes a lot of time, and systems are slow to move. Having high expectations of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities is critical, but also of the community and of family and friends. Relationships have to be built early to last. Family caregiver support is critical because they are instrumental in all aspects of a person's life. And natural supports matter a lot. Recent studies showed that people, kids who had natural supports had far better outcomes in all of these really critical areas of life. And policy advocacy has never, ever been as important as it is today at every level, everywhere, and for every issue. So the first one is, from my experience, post-secondary educators are not really trained to accommodate students with disabilities. Do you know, has there been anything made available to combat this or to address this? Yeah, I, well, one, I would say you're absolutely correct. It's no different than in special education, where general educators get a sliver of training around how to be inclusive. So I think there's a few places to start on campuses. One, find instructors who are your allies, who get it, who understand, and then partner them with the learning technologies folks that are on your campuses that are charged with accommodations and learning technology and how to maximize that, as well as equity and diversity officers on campuses and disability uh, resource centers on campuses. But I think it's one faculty at a time. And one last question. We do have a lot of different providers, community professionals, and families and caregivers here with younger children. And you mentioned in your presentation how important it is to start talking about this early. Do you have any strategies or suggestions to how to support a family to think about this early when they have so much on their plate with each kind of stage in life that they're in? Are there specific things they could do now? Yes. I, th I think, one, if you had to latch on to a model, um, and kind of a movement, it's Shelley Reynolds' work from uh, University of um, Missouri, and it's really about thinking from the very beginning about where you want your child to be as an adult, and then she's built planning tools that help you at each stage from early childhood through adulthood. A lot of states have kind of latched on to that model. Uh, it helps in family support. And then I would say just beefing up all family support activities. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 
with a promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.